Please remain standing and turn in your Bibles, if you would, to Psalm 2. Psalm 2 will be referenced today in Acts chapter 4. We'll be reading Psalm 2 and Acts chapter 4, the first 31 verses in Acts. Psalm 2 will begin in the first verse. Why are the nations in an uproar, and the peoples devising a vain thing? The kings of the earth take their stand, and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, Let us tear their fetters apart and cast away their cords from us. He who sits in heaven laughs. The Lord scoffs at them. Then he will speak to them in his anger. And terrify them in his fury, saying, But as for me, I have installed my king upon Zion, my holy mountain. I will surely tell of the decree of the Lord. He said to me, You are my son. Today I have begotten you. Ask of me, and I will surely give the nations as your inheritance, and the very ends of the earth as your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron. You shall shatter them like earthenware. Now therefore, O kings, show discernment. Take warning, O judges of the earth. Worship the Lord with reverence and rejoice with trembling. Do homage to the Son that he may not become angry and you perish in the way. For his wrath may soon be kindled. How blessed are all who take refuge in him. And then turning over to Acts chapter 4. We'll begin in the first verse of Acts chapter 4. As they were speaking to the people, the priests and the captain of the, guard, of the temple guard and the Sadducees came up to them, being greatly disturbed because they were teaching the people and proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. And they laid hands on them and put them in jail until the next day, for it was already evening. But many of those who heard the message believed, and the number of the men came to be about 5,000. On the next day, their rulers and elders and scribes were gathered together in Jerusalem. And Annas the high priest was there, and Caiaphas and John and Alexander, and all who were of high priestly descent. When they had placed them in the center, they began to inquire, By what power or in what name have you done this? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, Rulers and elders of the people, if we are on trial today for a benefit done to a sick man as to how this man has been made well, let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ the Nazarene, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by this name, this man stands here before you in good health. He is the stone which was rejected by you, the builders, but which became the chief cornerstone. And there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven that has been given among men by which we must be saved. Now as they observed the confidence of Peter and John and understood that they were uneducated and untrained men, they were amazed and began to recognize them as having been with Jesus. And seeing the man who had been healed standing with them, they had nothing to say in reply. But when they had ordered them to leave the council, they began to confer with one another, saying, What shall we do with these men? For the fact that a noteworthy miracle has taken place through them is apparent to all who live in Jerusalem. And we cannot deny it. But so that it will not spread any further among the people, let us warn them to speak no longer to any man in this name. And when they had summoned 
them, they commanded them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered and said to them, Whether it is right in the sight of God to give heed to you rather than to God, you be the judge. For we cannot stop speaking about what we have seen and heard. When they had threatened them further, they let them go, finding no basis on which to punish them, on account of the people, because they were all glorifying God for what had happened. For the man was more than 40 years old on whom this miracle of healing had been performed. When they had been released, they went, at, went to their own companions and reported all that the chief priests and elders had said to them. And when they heard this, they lifted their voices to God with one accord and said, O oh Lord, it is you who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and all that is in them, who by the Holy Spirit through the mouth of our father David, your servant, said, Why did the Gentiles rage and the peoples devise futile things? The kings of the earth took their stand and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his Christ. For truly in this city there were gathered together against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, and all the Gentiles and the peoples of Israel, to do whatever your hand and your purpose predestined to occur. And now, Lord, take note of their threats, and grant that your bondservants may speak your word with all confidence. While you extend your hand to heal and signs and wonders take place through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. And when they had prayed, the place where they had gathered together was shaken. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak the word of God with boldness. The grass withers and the flower fades. Please be seated, children are invited to Children's Church at this time. <coughs> I think we have officially reached half of the church being children. We're going to be back in Acts this morning, as is evident here. I had to be retrained this week after a week off, so I figured that you might need to be retrained as well to catch up to where we are in Acts. So I want to retell the story we're going through a little bit here. To give us context, we're going to concentrate on the last verses of this section we read. You may remember three weeks ago, Peter and John were entering the temple, and they saw a man sitting on the ground uh, at the gate to the temple. He was begging for alms, but Peter and John had no alms, had no money to give him. So Peter, not having money, commanded the man in the name of Jesus Christ, the Nazarene, to get up and walk. Instantly, this man got up and began to walk. He walked into the temple with them, and he was leaping and praising God. All the people saw this, and they knew who this man was, because he'd been at the gate for years. We're told that he was born lame. This miracle set up Peter's second sermon, which was like the first in that it was solely focused on Christ and who he was and what he did. In Peter's second sermon in chapter 3, Peter points out that the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of their fathers, glorified his servant, Jesus. Then he reminds the people he's speaking to that they disowned Jesus, that they killed Jesus. And he follows this up by pointing them to faith in Jesus who is the promised Messiah, who can wipe away their sins, who will give them times of refreshing in their soul. Peter points out that Jesus is to be obeyed, and this plays a large 
part in our text today. What Peter has done in his first two sermons is to point out that Jesus is the promised Messiah. In doing this, Peter is setting up a whole new way of approaching God. The temple is old, it's in the past, it's pre-Messianic. Christ is the fulfillment of the temple. He is the way to God. He is the mediator between God and man. He is the one who takes us into the throne room of God. What we will see today is the battle lines are being drawn between those who hold to the temple and the old ways, the old religious leaders. They're loyal to what they have versus Jesus and the fulfillment of the temple and his appointment of new leaders, the 12 apostles. This battle will lead to the persecution of the church as the church ramps up and takes off in its size and its influence as God does his work on earth. And so what we learn as we look at this history is that because Jesus uses us to build his kingdom, we must proclaim him. And as we do this, we must remember who God is, who we are, and our need for God's grace. As we enter our text, we find Peter and John in the temple. They're preaching to the people. They have an audience, and they're taking advantage of it. As they're doing this, the head of security comes up to them with the priests and the Sadducees. Now remember, the Sadducees did not believe in a resurrection in any form. Peter and John are preaching that the hope of the resurrection from the dead is found in Jesus. The Sadducees are mad on two fronts there. So security takes them and throws them in jail until the morning because the Sanhedrin, the Supreme Court, if you will, is not allowed to meet after dark. Here we have the beginning of the battle. The priests and Sadducees are seeking to silence the church. But the reality of what is happening is found in verse 4. Many who heard the preaching believed in Jesus. In fact, about 5,000 men. Now we can assume there are several thousand women and children in addition to the men. This is a big movement that is not going to be stopped. Remember who is in charge of the church. Jesus, the Son of God. It is not a man-made effort. It is divine. It is supernatural. Luke continues in verse 5 telling us the events of the next day. He tells us that Ananias, the high priest, and Caiaphas, John and Alexander, they're all present. You have to think about this context, historical context. In John 18, we were told that Annas and Caiaphas were at Jesus' trial. That's not very long ago. The room that they go in to have this trial would have been set up in a semicircle with 71 people of the Sanhedrin in their seats as the authorities. And Peter and John are brought to stand in the center before these 71 men highly respected in culture. All these men, these authorities want to know is, by what power or in what name have you done this? We're told that Peter was filled with the Holy Spirit. And he says, if we're on trial for healing a man, a lame man, then know that he was healed by the name of Jesus Christ the Nazarene, who you crucified, by the way but who God raised from the dead. Right in the face of the Sadducees. Jesus' name is why this man is healthy. Then he tells the Sanhedrin, he is the stone which was rejected by you, the builders 
but which became the chief cornerstone. Again, Peter references prophecy. We've seen this over and over in his sermons to show that Jesus is the fulfillment of it. And he concludes with this definitive statement. He's laying down the law, if you will. And there is no salvation. And there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven that has been given among men by which we must be saved. Peter is unequivocally saying who Jesus is. He is the only way to God, not your temple. He is the only way to be saved, not your lambs you're sacrificing. This is Peter and John's absolute position. Peter is pointing everyone to Jesus and what he did. Now verses 13 to 22, they tell us about the internal uh, deliberations of the Sanhedrin. St. Hedrin begins to remember that Peter and John, well, they were with Jesus. Then they see the man who's been healed. What are they going to say? He wasn't healed? Jesus didn't heal you? Everyone knew the man. So they dismiss Peter and John. They realize they can't dismiss this miracle. It's a problem. So they decide to bring Peter and John in to warn them to no longer speak in the name of Jesus. They're basically bringing them in and using intimidation. So they warn Peter and John accordingly. In verse 19 we read, Whether it is right in the sight of God to heed to you rather than to God, you be the judge. For we cannot stop speaking about what we have seen and heard. With this bold statement, Peter and John are defeating the Sanhedrin. The people are on their side. They're glorifying God because of what has happened in this miracle. Now look at verse 23. When they had been released, they went to their own companions and reported all that the chief priests and elders had said to them. They went to their own people. We're seeing the split. There's two sides. There's the religious leaders and there's the church. Peter and John's own people. When the church heard Peter and John's report, they lifted their voices as one to God. Now Luke records for us the prayer of the disciples. And it gives us great instruction. This is something we need to be remembered of constantly. Their prayer starts in verse 24. O Lord, it is you who made the heavens and the earth and the sea and all that is in them. Look at how they are teaching their hearts. How they are focusing their minds. Peter and John had just stood before the Supreme Court of Israel. The court that had put Jesus to death. They'd done so with boldness. Because they knew this to be true. They served the God of the universe. The very God who had made the heavens and the earth and the sea and all that is in them. When we focus ourselves on God and who he is, we are strengthened, we are encouraged, we are given hope. Peter and John could preach Jesus because they knew that God had exalted him to heaven. He was at God's right hand in heaven. They knew that God the Father had accepted the sacrifice of Jesus. They knew that God the Father was in control of all things, all events, and definitely in control of what would happen to them as they proclaimed Jesus. So they continued in their prayer. Verse 
verse 25. Who by the Holy Spirit, through the mouth of our father David your servant, said, Why do the Gentiles rage, and the peoples devise futile things? The kings of the earth took their stands, and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his Christ. The disciples looked at the prophecy concerning the Messiah, the Christ. And they read these words in Psalm 2, and they knew they applied to their circumstances now. They knew the world would hate Jesus, God's anointed. Jesus had told them that they would. They knew the world would rage against him. And it had done so through the Sanhedrin. This is exactly what they continue to pray in verse 27. For truly in this city right now, there were gathered together against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the people of Israel, to do whatever your hand and your purpose predestined to occur. As they pray, they are clear about who is in control. It is God the Father who accomplished what his hand set out to do. He accomplished his purposes. So as they preached and as they appeared before the Sanhedrin, they knew that God was in control. They knew that God was accomplishing his purposes. How about you? Do you believe that God is accomplishing his purposes in your life? When your children grow up and they don't do what you think they ought to be doing, is God in control? When that bill comes in, that takes all that money you've worked so hard to save. It blows your budget and you feel hopeless. Is God in control? When you're given an unethical ultimatum at work and you feel fear for your job, is God in control? What is it in your life that you fear most? Is God in control of that? We must remember who God is. He has created everything. He controls literally everything. There is a spiritual reality that is far greater than what we think our physical reality is. We need to remember, as they did, we're finite. And we need to turn and we need to look to God who is in control of all things. When we consider God and who he is, we're giving, given boldness to witness. We're given hope in this life. We're given security within ourselves. Everything good that we need comes out of considering who God is is. Remembering who God is. I want to continue looking at this prayer. It's so informative to us, so encouraging to us. Verse 29, and now Lord take note of their threats and grant that your bond servants may speak your word with all confidence. This verse calls us to remember why Peter and John were preaching Jesus. Remember back in chapter 1, Jesus tells them, You shall be my witnesses both in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the remotest part of the earth. Jesus had commissioned them to be his witnesses. They were witnessing to the Jews. They were telling the truth of who Jesus is, what the Jews had done to him, and the need to repent to turn to Jesus. This is who Jesus had made them. Jesus had told them to do this. So they were being obedient to his command. Now in the midst of their obedience, they're being attacked. They're being attacked by the Supreme Court. 
So they turn to God first and acknowledge who he is. And then they say, take note of their threats. They're saying, God, look down and see. God, look down and pay attention to what's going on here. But secondly, they say, grant that your bondservants may speak your word with all confidence. Notice they call themselves bondservants. They consider themselves to be slaves of Christ and of his gospel. They ask that God might help them to speak his word, his truth with confidence. But more than that, you know what's more striking here? What they don't say. What they don't ask for. They don't ask for those things I would be asking for. They don't ask God, protect us from suffering. Please make the road easy for us. They don't ask him to change their circumstances. They only ask him to be with them and to strengthen them. To strengthen them with confidence. To give them boldness. Remember, Paul, he asked the church to pray that he would be bold in presenting the gospel. You see, the world is God's problem. They've asked him to look at the world, to see it, to deal with it as he sees fit. But they are most concerned with themselves and how they will act and how they will be faithful to God. There's a real question here for us to ask ourselves. Are we more concerned with God changing the world around us so it's comfortable for us or are we more concerned that we remain faithful and confident in him as we proclaim him? Who is at the center of the first question that deals with our comfort? Aren't we? We want to be comfortable? Who is at the center of our desire to be faithful and confident in declaring the word of God? In that, aren't we aiming to honor our God and our Savior? How have we structured our lives? Where have we placed our values? As Americans, we don't expect to suffer. We're taught to focus on ourselves. It's normative in this culture to be self-centered. Look at your iPhone. What does it start with? But we're called to live for Christ, to be faithful to him, to trust him with our lives, for he knows best. And his plan for us is not comfort necessarily, but it's to be holy. It's to be more and more perfected, to be like Christ. If you don't believe that, go back to the first point. And remember that God is the maker of heaven and earth and the sea and all that is in them. And he sets the expectations for us. God has made us for himself. God has redeemed us to himself. And Jesus has called us to be faithful, to go and proclaim the gospel. Now I touched on the grace of God in the last point. But this prayer continues with a definite request for God's grace. Look at verse 30 with me. While you extend your hand to heal and signs and wonders take place through the name of your holy servant Jesus. The disciples are asking God to act. They're asking him to continue to extend his hand to heal and to accomplish signs and wonders. All of this is done through the name of God's servant, Jesus. The fact is that God's grace has been front and center. 
throughout the ministry of the disciples. Let's think this through, starting back at the beginning of Acts. In Acts chapter 1, verse 8, we read, You will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. The Holy Spirit is the one who empowered them for ministry. He was poured out on them by Jesus. Chapter 2, verse 4. We saw that the disciples were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues, which led to Peter's first sermon. In our passage today, Peter steps up to present Jesus before the Sanhedrin. And we read, Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, The power and grace of the Holy Spirit is what they seek from God. And it's what God gave them. Look at verse 31. And when they had prayed, the place where they gathered together was shaken, and they were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak the word of God with boldness. Here we see God fulfilling their request and giving them boldness. He also sent an earthquake that let them know of his good pleasure. His good pleasure with their prayer, with their behavior. It's not common for God to give earthquakes nowadays. But has God shaken your world as he has accomplished things for you in the past? Are there times where you just stood there amazed at what God had done for you? Where you think to yourself, God is obviously with me. He's with us. Have you prayed for God to give you boldness? And felt his presence with you as you stepped out in faith? Do you realize your dependence on God? And his power to accomplish ministry in his name? How many of you Sunday school teachers, children's church teachers, enter your class each week thinking, if God doesn't act, I am dead. The class will get nothing from what I've prepared. How often do you think as you seek to witness, if God doesn't use my words and empower them, nothing will happen? What about disciplining your children? Do you think if God doesn't change his or her heart through my instruction, nothing's going to happen? The church of Acts knew her vulnerability, and she sought God's grace and God's power. Do you realize, do you see your vulnerability, your finitude? Do you seek God's grace and his power. We've managed to raise a generation of anxious kids. You can read about it everywhere. You can see it as you engage with them. But you know what? They're not the only anxious ones. Anxiety runs through our culture. What is the cure for this anxiety? Is it not to see God for who he is? To understand his magnitude, his power, his sovereignty, his goodness to us? Isn't it to remember who he has made us? His people who are changed, to, changed and they're charged to represent him well? His people who he empowers through his spirit, giving us boldness giving us confidence, making us useful and successful in ministry. May we consider who God is. May we consider who he's made us. Can we, may we consider the grace that we depend on that he so freely gives us. May we understand that Jesus uses us to build his kingdom. And may we proclaim him and the boldness that he gives us. Let's pray. Father, this passage is so rich, so fertile for our spiritual lives.
We thank you for the reminder. We thank you for the direction, the path of this prayer to remember who you are, to consider your greatness, your holiness, your reign, to consider that you have called us not only to be your people, but you have called us to represent you to a dark and fallen world. May we strive by your grace to be faithful. We ask you to pour out your grace on us. Give us boldness. Give us confidence as we go forward in the name of Jesus. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.